saw the good news. There's the good news. Nassau's there, NOAA's there. These organizations are not monolithic. There are people within them that actually know what's going on. But they also get, between the two of them, over $2 billion in climate money from the federal government every year, and they don't really want to give that up. So if you are a career person in NASA or NOAA, you can talk about global greening now, because it's a fact and there's no, no doubt about it. It's been measured by satellites, and many different countries have done the work. But you'd better not talk about CO2 being a good thing. And you'd better not deny climate change caused by humans, which is catastrophic. That's only the group that calls itself the right climate stuff can do that. They are retired NASA astronauts and space engineers and space station architects, guys like that. They got a bit of education going for them. They are the right climate stuff and they're total, total skeptics. They don't believe a word of it, but they weren't able to say so till they retired. But they are able to talk about this, which is an amazing thing that's happening. Up until now, before we started putting CO2 in the air, when there was only 280, but when it was 180, they were almost all dying. But even at 280, plants are starving to death for CO2. It is the limiting factor on their growth in the whole world if there's enough water and nutrients present in the location for plants, CO2 will be the limiting factor. And it still is today. But now we fertilize these plants with a third again as much CO2. They're giving up to 30% increase in biomass and growth, especially in the driest places in the world. This is the CSIRO's work. It was the pioneering work the Commonwealth Re Science and Industry Research Organization, the peak science body in Australia. They are resulting in this greening of the earth and notice that it's more pronounced in the driest parts of the planet. And that is because CO2 also makes plants more efficient with water because now they don't have to have so many holes in the bottom of their leaves to suck in CO2 because CO2 is in higher concentration and so they can reduce the number of those stomata or close them more and thus lose less water. That is why plants are now creeping out onto grasslands all around the world and where it's dry like this, look at the sub-Saharan Sahel there, greening right up and they say it's turning into a desert. This is where the people lived when the Sahara was green in the Holocene climate optimum. Then when it got dry, when the neoglacial began, they moved into the Nile Valley, and that's believed to have been what caused the, all those people coming together, caused the Egyptian empire to emerge from that, because the, 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 you, all those red dots are towns on the Sahara Desert there. A warmer world will be a wetter world. A warmer world will evaporate more water from the sea, and the clouds that are formed will have a cooling effect which will moderate warming. So it's not going to be runaway warming, but it'll be a wetter world and more, a lusher world. India and China have planted more new trees and created more new forests than all the rest of the countries put together. That's not our fault because there actually isn't any room for more trees in Canada. But they had room for more trees. I'm, I'm sort of joking, but uh, it, we do have as many trees as we need at this, at this point. And, uh, and unfortunately, for the top half of the country is too cold for trees to grow. So if it got warmer, then we could ex expand the forest up there. Um, India and China are the leaders in greening the world. And here's what happens when you add CO2 to a greenhouse. This was actually not even a greenhouse. It was just enclosed in plastic. Because CO2 is the heaviest gas in the atmosphere, it tends to be able to sink down or stay down when you put it in. And so when you added CO2 to 150 plus or 300 plus or 450 plus, so there you have 850 ppm, the trees grow three or four times as fast. That's why every commercial greenhouse operator in the world buys carbon dioxide to put it in their greenhouse or uses the exhaust from their gas or wood heaters, which is rich in CO2 after putting it through a filter, 
to uh, enhance the CO2 in their greenhouse up to 800 to 1500 ppm. In other words, two to four times higher than it is in the atmosphere today to get 20 to 60 percent increase in yield at, in a shorter time in their greenhouses. Every greenhouse grower knows this, that the present atmosphere of planet Earth is a starvation diet for all the plants out there, except for the C4 plants, which are only 5 percent of the plants, and they only evolved because of low CO2. They are more efficient at using CO2. Corn is one of them, and there are quite a number of others. But most of our food crops are C3 plants, which is the way plants photosynthesized before this drought in CO2 emerged. Uh, you can see that CO2 is getting lower all the time, whereas temperature just goes ups and downs. In other words, they're not related. But what's causing the CO2 to get lower and lower? Look where the carbon is. Notice all these flows. Atmosphere 850, that's how much is up there. Plants have 560, soils 1500. So between plants and soils, they have twice as much carbon in them as the whole atmosphere of the Earth. That's how low it is. It used to be in the thousands up in the atmosphere, not 850. Look at the fossil fuels containing 5,000 to 10,000 billion tons of carbon. But look at the number below that. 100 million billion tons of carbonaceous rocks. What are carbonaceous rocks? They are calcium carbonate and calcium magnesium carbonate formed by living things, the shells of calcifying marine organisms. There are 100 million billion tons of carbon covering 8 percent of the Earth's crust where the carbon has been lost to the cycle, sequestered as they like to call it. It is missing in action. These guys did it. 500 million years ago, many species of marine life learned to control the crystallization of calcium carbonate to make armor plating for their soft bodies. Crabs and shrimp are in this too. I just don't have them in the picture. But these are ones that have solid calcium carbonate shells. The coccolithophores on the left are plants. They are microscopic and they're beautiful. Then you have the seashells on the top, the mollusks. And then on the left, you have the foraminifera, which are animals, zooplankton. The little holes in that netting exactly fit one of those coccolithophores in it. So they go through the ocean sideways, grazing through blooms of coccolithophores and feed up. That's the food chain in the sea beginning. Then you have the coral reefs, which are 50 percent of all the calcium carbonate that has been made into sediment. That's where the gas and oil is too, because the organisms that were inside those dead calcifying marine species turned into gas and oil. So the shale deposits are largely made of calcium carbonate. So that's where the calcium carbonate went. That's where the CO2 went. That's why that green line keeps going down, because the marine calcifying organisms, unbeknownst to themselves, were presaging the death of life on Earth for lack of carbon dioxide. We came along. This is what would have happened in the absence of human CO2 emissions. That blue line, which is a line that did occur for 150 million years, and we know it, I have only extrapolated it down to zero. And long before it got to zero, the life would be dying on the Earth. We have restored a balance to the global carbon cycle just as inadvertently as the calcifying species presaged its doom. We are not the destroyer of life. We are its salvation. And I've been giving this presentation for five years at the Global Warming Policy Fund in London, England, by the Thames River in the Institute of Mechanical Engineers with a lot of really smart people in the audience. And a hundred times since, and no one has questioned this. No one has said you're full of it. It's nothing to do with the calcifying marine organisms. And life would not have disappeared if we hadn't come along and started restoring a balance. Someday, believe me, every country will be required when the fossil fuels are gone, which will be a long time from now. We're sure not going to see it. When the fossil fuels are gone and all we have left is nuclear energy and hydroelectric, we can make carbon dioxide from limestone with solar energy and nuclear energy if we wanted to. 
We can make carbon dioxide from limestone to replenish the CO2 as the, because we don't want to kill all the marine calcifying species. We want to be able to keep replacing the, C, the carbon they take out. Every country in the world will have a quota for the amount of CO2 that it is required to release annually in order to be in line with international norms and the survival of life on Earth. That is my positive message. We are the salvation of life, not its destroyer. Thank you very much. Hey, that was great. <laughs>